UN figures show India was the world's third largest emitter of carbon dioxide in 2020. But that picture is changing. It already has the means to generate over 40% of its power from renewables. And the government has now set an ambitious target of taking that ratio to 50% by 2030. Well, step forward Indian renewable energy giant Renew, with a portfolio including more than 120 wind, solar and hydro projects across nine Indian states. Renew says part of its goal is helping India to reach net zero and it says the government and private sector working together is the key in the fight against climate change. Joining us now is Sumant Sinha, he's founder and CEO of Renew. Fantastic to have you on the show, sir. I noticed a change. The last time we spoke, you were Renew Power and now you're Renew. You. What's in the name change and what does it mean for the company? Yeah, thank you, Julia, so much for having me on the show again. Uh, look, I think uh, you've alluded to a very important thing. While the change is small, uh, but it's actually very important, uh, simply because what it means is that we are trying to really become a much more broader decarbonization partner rather than a company that is focusing only on the power sector. So certainly we are going to continue doing that. But we also intend to look at corporates and help them try to decarbonize as they move forward on their own journeys uh, and provide them a much more broader set of solutions, which could be around green hydrogen, uh, green fuels, uh, carbon credits, uh, digital solutions, and so on. So we're actually trying to become a broader company, which is really operating uh, in the decarbonization space more generally. And uh, that is really why we changed our name from Renew Power to Renew. It's uh, subtle, but it's very important to us. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge opportunity. And I think the major point to make here is that if the nation isn't coordinating and organizing with the private sector, then some of the lofty targets for the Indian government, like reaching that target uh, of generating 50% of power from renewables by 2030 simply isn't going to happen. I mean, isn't it already a huge challenge? It's beyond ambitious to try and achieve this in the space of, what, seven years. What does it mean for you specifically in terms of opportunity, but also, I think, challenges? What more do you need from the government to achieve it? Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right that India has set a very ambitious target. But I think it's absolutely necessary that countries like India uh, do set such uh, aspirational targets because, frankly, as we all know, we really don't have a choice. Um, and it's not just India. I think every other country around the world has to take leadership uh, in their own way and set targets that they then have to strive to meet. Now, India, as you know, uh, as you said, is the third largest carbon emitting country. Uh, given the growth that we uh, have in the country over the next several years, if we continue to grow in the same way, which is really carbon intensive, then obviously that will not be good for uh, the uh, environment and for the world as a whole. And I think therefore that the Prime Minister uh, uh, Narendra Modi has taken a very positive step in really setting targets that are really looking at focusing on growing in a very different way and decarbonizing the economy as we grow, continue to grow as well. What that means for us essentially is, uh, obviously we have to work very closely with the government. Uh, while the government is setting targets, ultimately it's up to the private sector to actually, you know, uh, continue to sort of do action on the ground and meet those targets. And that's not just in India, but in every other country in the world, the same thing needs to happen. Now, what are the challenges? The challenges are many, uh, Julia. I think just given the scale of what we're trying to achieve collectively, uh, there are a number of things that we need to do. I think number one, of course, is uh, uh, finding the appropriate amounts of land. Uh, two is building the interconnect or the transmission networks. Three is obviously we have to source equipment. Four, we have to hire people. And five, then we have to create all these assets on the ground. And I think all of those areas, not just in India, but everywhere globally, uh, are being constrained uh, given the scale of growth that we require to meet the challenge. And so I think all of us have to collectively put in our best foot forward to make this happen. Yeah, people infrastructure, never mind anything else. All of this needs scaling up yesterday. And, and the hope is that it can happen within the space of a few years in order to be able to, to hit some of these targets that are expected in the next sort of seven to 10. Um, does India need the equivalent? And I use the United States as the example simply because I think it's the biggest we've ever had, the inappropriately named Inflation Reduction Act, which seemed to be the most comprehensive climate bill that we've seen around the world. That surely 
presents opportunities for you internationally, perhaps, to invest in the United States. But rather than decrying it in, for example, the EU has done and sort of suggesting that it's creating competition, isn't this the kind of thing that every nation needs to be announcing and applying in order to create a global solution to, to tackling climate change? No, you're absolutely right, Julia. And of course, while countries may decry the uh, industrial policy nature of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, the reality is that it's in service of a good uh, objective, which is to decarbonize and to move the world closer to net zero as fast as possible. And so therefore, if it actually uh, leads to a genuine race towards net zero, I think that's something that needs to happen. Now, obviously, the question for all of us is, uh, as corporates, is whether, therefore, we all tend to look at the U.S. market or whether we continue to focus on our domestic markets or our home markets. And I think we have to do a bit of both. Uh, we cannot ignore what's happening in the U.S. Um, and so we do have to look at opportunities there. But at the same time, we obviously cannot ignore what's happening in our home markets. And we have to continue to add capacity uh, at home as well. Uh, now, of course, if India does come out with something similar, uh, then, of course, that would be a great positive because it would bring down costs for uh, clean energy in general. Uh, now, India has done something similar, not, of course, of the same scale. But, for example, India has announced a national green hydrogen policy. We've come out with these very aggressive targets for renewable energy. We are building out transmission set systems across the country and allowing renewable energy to tap into it uh, without a charge. So that's actually a very big benefit. So there are a number of things that India is doing as well, which hopefully will lead to the development of a pretty large domestic market and will help us get closer to the targets that the Prime Minister said, which are, as you said earlier, ambitious but necessary. It's interesting on green hydrogen. I was in the Middle East last year and um, obviously bearing in mind um, the geography and the uh, extent of exporting of uh, fossil fuels from that region, there was a sort of reticence to discuss green hydrogen and concerns about still the risk reward. Are you saying actually based on the incentives that India's provided as far as you're concerned, we're sort of past that tipping point for green hydrogen? Because that would be huge. I think, Julia, not yet, because ultimately green hydrogen, keep in mind, is competing with gray hydrogen, which is a lot cheaper today, given where gas prices are in most geographies. And we're also competing with blue hydrogen, uh, which is uh, uh, you know, also something that is currently cheaper. And, and therefore, you know, I think green hydrogen still has a way to go before we can actually be super competitive with the other forms of hydrogen. But that's really where government policy need is, is, is important because we need mandates for green hydrogen. Uh, and just like in solar where prices came down, I think similarly the same thing can happen for green hydrogen as well as the ecosystem builds up. So I think we need an initial set of mandates across the world for users of gray hydrogen to move towards green. And I think you'll get to, you'll get to the tipping point then fairly quickly. But keep in mind also that green hydrogen is the basis for a lot of the green fuels which will go into things like shipping and into aviation. And therefore, it's, it's a very important uh, prerequisite, green hydrogen, for really getting into the hard to abate sector. So uh, collectively, we have to push forward and make green hydrogen competitive because that's going to really take forward the decarbonization into other areas of energy beyond just the power sector, which is really something that is very important now. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I, I, it's going to be truly transformative. We just have to get there. And we need the investment to get there. Um, Great to chat to you, sir. As always, 20 more questions for you, but we'll reconvene very soon, I hope. Sumit Sinha there, the founder and CEO of Renew. Sir, great to have you on. Thank you.